Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hamlin, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great event on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to listen to it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out a link that, uh, an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your go to webinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can during today's webinar. During today's webinar, we will also have two polling questions. So please, uh, hopefully we can get everybody involved in responding to those polling questions. And finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our three lucky winners. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Mainframe DevOps, a Zoe CLI enabled roadmap. Our speakers today are Sujay Solomon, who is with Broadcom and the Zoe Leadership Community, or Committee, sorry, and Mike Bauer, who is with Broadcom and Zoe. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. All right, Sujay, I'm going to go ahead and put myself on mute. I know you got a great presentation, so I'll let you get right to it. All right, so let's get started. Okay, hi, hi, folks. Um, glad you could join us. Uh, I hope you're all safe and healthy amidst the uh, COVID-19 and all that's going on. Uh, just a, a quick agenda uh, here. Uh, we'll do introductions uh, between me and Mike, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of the state of, of mainframe within DevOps today, uh, what we're seeing as, as patterns. Uh, we'll uh, then dive a little bit deeper into the technology. So Zoe CLI, uh, we'll talk about what it is and how people are using it today. And then uh, we'll you know, introduce a roadmap for you that we've seen a lot of folks come up with uh, when we worked with them in, in you know, building DevOps around mainframe. So some phases uh, that have been very effective with, with folks we've worked with. Next, uh, uh, we'll take one phase from that roadmap and we're gonna do a deeper dive demo into that. And Mike will be showing you some of that uh, today and then we'll, we'll wrap it up with some Q&A at the end. So uh, my name is Sujay Solomon. Um, um, I'm with Broadcom. I'm also in the Zoe Leadership Committee. Uh, I've been uh, in the mainframe uh, area for close to a, a decade now. Uh, and recently, the last few years, I've been heavily involved with uh, CA Brightside which some of you might have heard of. It was actually featured on uh, DevOps.com in previous webinars. And uh, thanks for the recognition. And in 2018, uh, we were actually recognized as the most innovative DevOps solution of the year. And along with that, uh, some of that was actually donated to an open source project called Zoe that we'll talk about today. And, and I've uh, been involved there as well. Uh, Mike, how about a quick introduction from you? Uh, thanks, CJ. Uh, so as CJ introduced me, I'm Mike Bauer. Happy to be on the call today. Um, I'm, all, I'm a product owner within the Broadcom organization. I'm also the Zoe CLI squad lead. I've traveled uh, a lot recently running interactive labs and workshops and, and demos with customers who are interested in incorporating mainframe in their enterprise uh, DevOps initiatives and, and hope to talk to you uh, all about that today as well. Um, CJ said he's been in the industry for about 10 years. I, I've been in the industry for about half that time, um, about five years now, um, based in the uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. And, and uh, I've been with Brightside and Zoe um, for a long time now. I think we're going on almost three years. All right, thanks, Mike. All right, so let's get started with just, you know, the, the state of, of DevOps and mainframe today. Um, just a refresher, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but what is DevOps at its basic level? It's a set of practices which aims to reduce the time between development making code changes and those changes within the application actually making it into production uh, and ensuring that 
quality does not degrade. So you've got to keep the quality at a high level. That's what DevOps aims to do at a basic level. And uh, that's actually, I'm, I'm quoting it straight from uh, researches from CSIRO and uh, the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Now, DevOps as a concept has really grown uh, in the last 10 years or so, coinciding with the explosive growth of web applications uh, and those growing. And while DevOps has become an organic part of web development, mainframe development to some extent has been left behind and you know, labeled as legacy and so on. But in the last few years, enterprises have realized that they're not able to fully reap the rewards of DevOps practices because that critical mainframe cog was sort of left, be left behind. So now, there's a strong desire within enterprises to reach that final frontier by actually bringing mainframe into the DevOps fold. And in fact, uh, I was at uh, Gene's uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit last year, and he had five firms kind of on the main stage talking about uh, their journey towards DevOps. And out of the five, three of them shared some of the hardships that they were having with onboarding mainframe onto uh, this DevOps journey that, are, that they're on. So reality is, you know, there's mainframe tools and practices, and there is a large gap between uh, distributed DevOps tools and practices that exist today. Now, I will say though, it's a myth that mainframe does not practice DevOps. It's not entirely true. There might be partial truths to that. Reality is mainframe does practice DevOps. It's, you know, they kind of do it in their own way. And like most things <laughs> at, with mainframe, it's done its own way. And it wasn't labeled DevOps. So if you think about it, the platform has been added for 40 plus years. Uh, do we really think that mainframers did not put effort into streamlining the path for application changes to make it into production and also making sure that quality is kept up? Of course they did. They just did it using tools and concepts that were native to the mainframe platform because that's all that was available at the time. So not fully uh, true that mainframe does not practice DevOps. However, there is somewhat of a conundrum. So here's a sort of a playback I'll do here that I, I see to this type of interaction, interaction often where uh, you know somebody on the DevOps side might say, do you need help, you know, you mainframe or do you need help uh, with using DevOps to automate more of what you do. And the mainframe person might turn around and say, no, we already have everything automated on the mainframe. What do you really want us to do? The DevOps folks say, do you have a pipeline where I can check out your deployment logs? Uh, where can I go see your code quality scan results? So how exactly are you doing DevOps? And the mainframe person might say, hey, you know, just drop me a note and I can share our deployment logs with you or I can share our, our code review meeting minutes with you. And they're, they're happy to help there. And, you know, the DevOps person might look at a log like this, maybe something from uh, a 3270 terminal and they're not going to understand it. And that's kind of where the disconnects start happening. So what I would say, you know, a call to action for all of you DevOps folks who are on the webinar, you know, we need to recognize and accept that mainframers have actually employed a lot of automation and processes to streamline the deployments and ensure quality. Um, it's, you can't be, we can't be denying that. Now, educating them on the services that DevOps provides today and how uh, their applications on the mainframe platform could benefit from that will go a long way in, in kind of starting with collaborating and identifying where uh, these you know, bottlenecks are and where uh, there are candidates for automation. Uh, but given all of that, I would say uh, you know, uh, be prepared to make some compromises. Uh, we're not, you're not gonna get all that you want in terms of getting everything automated, everything in an audit trail, everything in a CI CD pipeline, there's compromises that will have to be made, baby steps that need to be taken. Now, on the flip side, uh, to the mainframe folks who are on the webinar, you know, there's there's something to be said that uh, the software world 
has grown to be you know millions and millions of smart developers uh, solving the same software delivery problems that all platforms including the mainframe platform have faced over several decades in some cases the modern software world has come up with uh, you know intuitive and creative ways of solving these problems some of them are wrapped into many devops tools today and it would be useful to work with your DevOps folks to identify where you might benefit from adopting some of these newer tools and, and methodologies and concepts to reduce your bottlenecks and identifying low hanging fruit that could be automated. So be open to change, but definitely be practical in terms of the rate of change. Uh, it, it may take some time. Now to facilitate a lot of this, what we do have is a new open source project, which some of you may have heard of, called Zoe. Uh, Zoe has four uh, components. So uh, there's a command line interface, which we'll be focusing on mostly today uh, for automation purposes. These are actually powered by APIs, which are managed in the API mediation layer. Uh, there's a web UI, mostly targeting folks on the system side. And then uh, there's also a new incubation project within Zoe uh, for a mobile application. So that's what's in Zoe. Zoe is hosted by Linux Foundation's Open Mainframe project. And it was the first open source project for ZOS, which is the main operating system on the mainframe. The initial contributions were from Broadcom, IBM, and Rocket. Uh, IBM actually brought in uh, quite a few microservices into Zoe that are critical to the operation of Zoe. And we've had more than 7,000 downloads. And at our core, we aim to bridge the gap between mainframe and enterprise DevOps. And we wanna build a community around mainframe and bringing DevOps into the fold and make mainframe actually an exciting platform for folks to work on. Um, those are the primary goals for Zoe. Now, the approach we're taking within Zoe to facilitate some of this is, you know, there's a lot of services and tools that run on the mainframe platform on ZOS. Now, rather than building tight integration between these tools and specific tools off platform, say Jenkins or Rally or Jira or any of these popular agile DevOps tools, we're taking the approach of creating interfaces that will just help folks create these bridges and connect these tools in a natural organic way themselves. So moving away from proprietary and tight integration approaches and rather taking this open first approach where you have the freedom of choice and you are able to actually go and choose tools that perhaps your, your distributed site has already started using and you wanna align what tools you use on the mainframe site for DevOps according to the choices that were already made at the enterprise level. All of that is possible with Zoe. And a major side effect of a lot of this is, you know, since there's no tight integration and it's all organic, natural, there's very minimal disruption. Uh, you don't have to change the way some of your folks already work on the platform, so you're minimizing risk and you're speeding up the process to modernization and integrating with off-platform DevOps tooling. So that's the approach that Zoe is taking. So with that, uh, we're gonna run our first poll question now. All right, great. You should see our first polling question pop up on your screen right now. The question is how aligned are your mainframe and distributed DevOps teams today? You can choose from not unified, barely unified, somewhat unified, highly unified or completely unified. We'll give you guys a couple seconds to go ahead and make your choice. And while you're doing that, I do wanna remind the audience that you have, uh, anytime you have a question uh, during today's presentation, you have the opportunity to use the GoToWebinar control panel to submit your question, and we'll get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Okay, we'll give you guys about 10 more seconds and then we'll go ahead and close it out, take a quick look at the results, and then we'll move rapidly along in today's presentation. Okay, closing it out now. And whoops, uh, where'd they go? There you go, here's the results. So just a quick look here, then I'll close it out. Okay, all right. Back at you, Sujay. 
All right. Thanks a lot. Yep. Okay. Thank you for the poll, folks. Um, so now we're going to start talking about the tech. Uh, so I mentioned within Zoe, uh, there's a command line interface. But before we talk about that specific command line interface, what are CLIs in general? You know, if you open up a terminal and you type commands in there, whether it's a bash terminal or maybe if you're on Windows, you might be on command prompt, you can issue commands and get responses back, right? The biggest strength of those types of tools, CLIs, is the fact that you can create easy automation and script up things like your code build, your testing, your deployments, and much more. So this is why a lot of popular dev tools today, you know, Angular is a, is a, is a um, UI framework, Docker, Git, AWS, all of these tools offer CLIs, which are developers' favorite tools for automating things. And they're used not just by developers, they're used by release managers, they're used by folks like site reliability engineers and so on to automate more and more of what they do in, a, in, in their scripting language of choice. So that was our CLIs in general. Now, specifically within Zoe, what we've done is we have built something called Zoe CLI, which sits on top of REST APIs and continues to keep mainframe security in place. So just like how you could issue commands to interact with cloud platforms like AWS and such uh, from the, the, the comfort of your terminal on your, your workstation, uh, you can now issue Zoe CLI commands to interact with the numerous services on the mainframe side. And what that allows these folks to do, whether you're a developer, DevOps person on the system side, uh, you can now start using these modern DevOps tools that uh, easily are able to consume CLIs and APIs. Uh, so in today's webinar, we'll be focusing on how to use the CLI to connect more of mainframe to some of these modern DevOps tools. So what's in the CLI? So uh, the CLI, I've got a screenshot up here. So I've got a Mac, so this is a bash terminal. Uh, I just typed in Zoe and uh, the list of services that are available to me on the mainframe shows up. Uh, really simple form pattern, you know, just Zoe followed by any command that you want to issue, group and so on. Uh, pretty typical of CLIs. You can install it on your workstation. Could be a PC, Mac, Linux, whatever it is. Uh, and there's numerous ZOS services at your fingertips. You know, we've got some Broadcom tools here like CA View, uh, Endeavor, uh, uh, Ops MVS and so on, uh, FileMaster Plus. Uh, uh, there's also tools from IBM, so things like DB2, IMS, Kix, so on, ZOS Connect. So a large, large variety of services. I probably don't even have all of the plugins installed on mine, but the point here is this is extensible. Uh, anybody, any vendor can build plugins for Zoe CLI. Uh, so it, it's one CLI for multiple vendors so that you don't have to go uh, try to find different CLIs from different vendors to build up your automation. And another advantage is, of course, the fact that you can choose your scripting language of choice. You know, could be shell scripting, Python, whatever you'd like that works best for you. And using this, you know, some of what people have done already are they abstract their build process. So on the mainframe, you might be using something like Endeavor, uh, or you know, you might be working with the COBOL compiler directly. You can abstract that build uh, using Zoe CLI. You can perform deployments. You can write automated testing. Uh, you can build CI/CD pipelines by creating scripts and so on. There's lots of use cases. Uh, honestly, you know, folks that are experimenting and using with using it are going to come up with a lot more than what we can uh, come up with here. But if you would like to install this and start using it, it's available on zoe.org uh, or it's actually also available on npmjs.com because Zoe CLI is actually a Node.js based tool. Uh, so it's hosted on npmjs in addition to being on zoe.org. So that's the tool. Uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of that in the roadmap that we'll talk about. But you know, as Mike mentioned earlier, we've been traveling a lot. Uh, in fact, I think last year I, I, I was probably only home for about a, a third of the year. So in some ways, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying being home right now rather than being out in the road and traveling. Uh, but some of what we've learned from there are there's a desire when we uh, pick a DevOps approach 
to quickly show business value to executive leadership so that you can gain sponsorship from that. Uh, and then there's also desire to introduce DevOps concepts into the mix without really disrupting your existing developer workflow. So they're doing certain things in a certain way today, and we want to kind of softly land DevOps rather than uh, you know throw it at their face and really change the way that they're working right away. So it needs to come in in a, in a slow fashion where it doesn't disrupt what they're doing. There's also desire to actually change the developer experience, but we want to preserve their existing tooling and interfaces. So, you know, the classic interfaces that people might use to be productive, those need to remain. Uh, for example, let's say that you've, you've got some kind of a production bug and you need to be urgently able to fix that. These newer tools cannot come in the way of that. Uh, if need be, uh, the teams should be able to go to their interface of choice where they feel the most productive, uh, especially when it's cases that, that you need urgent attention on. So it's important to preserve access to both. You may also have teams where you know folks are proficient in uh, the classic interfaces and they may actually prefer to continue working there. Uh, while some of the newer folks may want to pr prefer using some of the, the, the modern tools. So giving them access to both seems to be quite important. Another major desire is to increase quality of change requests. So when a bug is found in production, it's a lot more expensive to fix it than finding it earlier in the process. So increasing the quality of the change requests is important. There's also a desire to have artifact and deployment audit trails, you know, things like uh, deployment logs where you're able to see when was the build done? What was the source of the artifact? Uh, where was it tested and when did it get deployed into production? All of those items should be in an audit trail. Finally, uh, there's a, a, a desire to have confidence in the ability to do quick backouts if a deployment doesn't work. So you shouldn't have to scramble and find all these people right in the moment where a deployment fails. You should have a process that automatically backs things out and gets you going as soon as possible. So those are uh, patterns that we've seen. Now, the next step here is uh, the fact that, you know, this might not be true for everybody. Um, this, these are patterns we've observed, but every business is unique. So your mileage may vary a little bit, uh, but, you know, based off of what we've seen, this is, this is quite common in terms of what uh, patterns we, we've seen in terms of use cases for DevOps and mainframe. So implementing this, uh, as I mentioned, we want to take a phased approach. Uh, so we want to show business value quickly, and we want to get these into developers' hands without really disrupting them too much. So a solution is to build a CI pipeline that performs static code analysis using Zoe CLI. And we'll actually be digging into this use case uh, with Mike a little bit later. You want to automatically trigger this pipeline off of an event. Uh, that is already part of the developer's workflow. So we don't want to introduce steps into the developer's workflow just to kick off the pipeline. It needs to be done automatically. So for example, maybe on a tool like CA Endeavor, which is a popular source control management tool on the mainframe, uh, a person may uh, ch you know, uh, check in uh, an element into Endeavor and that might trigger the pipeline rather than them doing it manually. Benefits here, you know, when the results are sent back to the developers, that's going to result in faster code reviews. Uh, you shouldn't uh, have to look at each, um, you know, each element that was changed manually. Uh, it's been already run through these uh, static code analysis tools, and it should speed up code reviews, which is a measurable benefit. So there's measurable benefits and there's subjective benefits. Obviously, it's better to have many measurable benefits so you can really you know, put a pin on it and say, hey, here's where we were and here's how much we've improved on it. The second one, of course, is more maintainable code. So over time, uh, the fact that your code is going to be run through quality analysis is going to ensure that uh, your code is of high quality. And when new folks come in, uh, they're able to actually jump in and maintain that code quite easily. Phase two is IDEs, Git, and Dev uh, Task Automation. So this is where we're starting to introduce some changes into the actual developer experience. Uh, we want to bring in lightweight IDEs, such as uh, Visual Studio Code, and pair them 
with mainframe extensions like code for z uh, which actually help with source code editing as well as debugging uh, in languages like COBOL. Next, source code access. So uh, your source code might be on an SEM like Endeavor, but developers today like to access it through Git. So connect Git with Endeavor. And then finally, uh, build some automation from the IDE that's able to trigger code analysis, builds, and deployments because context switching for developers is ex expensive. So if you're able to br bring all this into the IDE, the builds, accessing source code, debugging, then they are just going to be more productive and it's going to lower the time that developers take to perform builds and deployments. Uh, with the introduction of Git, there's more parallel development that can happen, which is measurable. Uh, and then of course, uh, with all these new tools coming into play, people are going to have an easier time working on the platform. So, you know, uh, new tools, uh, easier to hire folks, easier to keep developers happy working on the platform as well. Phase three is automated testing, where we want to increase the quality of change requests. Uh, so choose testing frameworks that work for you, like Mocha or JMeter, and preferably that would align with the frameworks that your web teams or your API teams are already using. And you know, dedicate maybe 15, 20% of your sprints to building up automation using Zoe CLI and some of these open testing frameworks that exist. The test logic runs off platform and it only accesses the mainframe when it needs to run a transaction or submit a job that's part of a batch application and get some results back. So all the, the, uh, the assertions and the test logic is kept off platform. The business benefits here, are you're reducing the number of bugs that enter production. Uh, that's just, uh, just going to save us so much money uh, in terms of fixing bugs earlier in the cycle rather than uh, later in production. Next, uh, faster time to delivery of application changes by reducing testing time. So I've heard plenty of teams say they spend probably three, four times the amount of time that they spend on changing code in testing. So when we reduce the amount of time it takes to test things, you're gonna accelerate the delivery of your application changes, which is a primary goal of DevOps. And finally, phase four and onwards is advanced CI CD. So we started with CI CD in phase one with static code analysis. We're gonna add things like artifact deployment trails and backouts into CI CD. So you can orchestrate your change requests in CI CD and even integrate it with ticketing tools like ServiceNow and so on using Zoe CLI. You can perform deployments to all kinds of ZOS middleware, uh, you know, uh, MQ, Kix, IMS, and so on from CI CD using Zoe CLI. And you can also build backouts in CI CD using Zoe CLI, you know, uh, if a sanity test fails, uh, just back things out, resulting in more frequent deployments your improved CLA because, you know, if something does go wrong, your backouts are automated and fast. And your audits, internal audits and so on, are going to be faster because you've got a log within your CI CD pipelines that has everything in it. So all of these are measurable benefits. So today's demo is going to focus on code quality scans, uh, which is from phase one and parts of phase two, where we've got a feedback loop for developers. So this is kind of a friction-free way of introducing DevOps where they don't really have to change the way they work too much. Uh, it's all just within automation. The tools we're gonna be using, Sonar Cloud, uh, Zoe CLI, and CA Endeavor today. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Mike to walk us through this demo. All right, thanks, Sujay. Uh, so as Sujay mentioned, we're gonna be focused mostly on phase one, which is not impacting how the developers are working today in your organization. But in order for me to show you how to create the CI CD pipeline, I need to sort of show you how I build these things. And, and the first step is connecting these uh, tools and services um, interactively. Um, so in the first demo, uh, the interactive demo, I will retrieve source code that currently lives on ZOS using the Zoe CLI. And then I'll push to the code analysis server using a sonar scanner CLI tool. So specifically, the, the technologies involved in this demonstration are, uh, first, I have all my source living on the mainframe in CA Endeavor, which is a product that 
in uh, it's an SCM that lives on the uh, on the mainframe, and I need to pull that code onto my machine. Zoe CLI is the tool I use to interact with the mainframe from my PC, and specifically, I need this uh, Endeavor for Zoe CLI plugin. That's what enables me to interact with the Endeavor uh, backend. This, this tool set is built um, on Node. Uh, I'll also be using uh, Node in, in a project where I use Gulp as well. I'll show the benefits of using task runners and things as well in this demonstration. Um, it just allows um, more ease of use when, you're, uh, when you want to abstract multiple CLI commands and maybe put them in a script or something like that. Once I have the code on my PC, I'm gonna use similar tools um, to push that and interact with um, a cloud's uh, hosted code analysis tool, that's Sonar Cloud. This is the, you may have heard of Sonar Cube. This is the public instance of, uh, of a Sonar Cube server, so that it's just available in the, in the public space. And the tool I use to push to that is the Sonar Scanner CLI. So just like I have CLIs to interact with cloud tools, Zoe CLI is my tool to interact with the mainframe. So with that, Sujay, could you pass me control? <clears throat> Share my screen. CJ, could you uh, let me know, can you see my screen? Yep, I can see it. Okay, perfect. So just starting very uh, simple here, I am in a Visual Studio Code uh, IDE environment, and I'm in uh, this demo folder. As you can see, there's nothing in my folder currently. I, the code is on, only on the, on the mainframe. So I'm going to use the Zoe CLI to pull the code to my machine. If I want to um, do that, I need to be able to interact with the um, remote environment. If I did Zoe Endeavor, being the um, sub command, the, the Endeavor plugin, list elements, and showed the help for that, we would see uh, a significant number of options I need to provide here. Okay, so I need to specify, um, you know, possibly the connection information to interact with this service, as well as um, environment name, system name, uh, subsystem name, et cetera. Um, profiles are a concept in the CLI that makes it easier to run these commands, so you don't have to re-specify all the options. And, and Sonar Scanner has a similar um, feel as well, and I'll, I'll show how it um, manages properties that you would otherwise have to re-enter uh, as well. So here, if I do Zoe profiles list endeavor, you can see it, um, the profile I am using for today's demonstration. So I need to specify a host and port to connect to the service, uh, user password, et cetera. Similar, uh, that's just the connection information in order to communicate what sort of, you can think of it as a repository that I wanna interact with, I have the concept of an Endeavor location profile. And this makes running commands very easy within the CLI because I don't have to repeatedly enter that information. If I just wanna list the elements in my, uh, in my repository here, this will run out and show me, I have a number of different programs. But my goal is to get this source onto my local machine, and I can do that using the Zoe Endeavor Retrieve Element command. And I can do wildcarding. So in this demo, I'm just going to take the first 10 elements. They're all of type COBOL. I'm going to put them in my working directory. And I don't need to sign them out because I'm just running them through a code analysis tool, right? I'm not making any changes or anything like that. So this will go prepare the list of elements to retrieve and begin retrieving them um, from Endeavor. 
and you can see over here it's already started working um, in my folder so there's dev one and then you can see the structure is the same you have system subsystem and then um, the type of element so here pulling all these uh, COBOL elements locally. Okay, so now what I've accomplished so far is I've pulled the elements from Endeavor and they're sitting on my PC. Now I need to push them to Sonar Cloud, which is a uh, the publicly hosted Sonar Cube server. So if I go, this is my uh, Sonar Cloud um, view, and I want to add a new project. So if I do analyze new project, it's integrated well with GitHub, but basically I just want to test this one on my machine so I can go down and select create manually. And for this, I'm going to call it Marvel's demo and set up. And right off the bat, it knows that I either want to do this manually or integrate with a CI tool. Uh, to start, I'm just going to show uh, the manual steps. So other, because I'm analyzing COBOL code, uh, happen to be on the Linux machine. So the first step would be download and unzip the sonar scanner tool, similar to um, when you install this and use it similar to how you use our CLI and Zoe. Um, but that has already been done in my environment. And then it tells you this command to run. I'm just going to copy that to my clipboard. In, and I'll paste the command in this scratch document so you can all see. Now, one thing I need to add here is by default, it's not going to recognize the, the extensions associated with COBOL files. So I can just specify um, another option here. Um, COBOL file suffixes is the, is the name here. So let me specify that. And I should be good to go now. So I'm going to run this command. And again, just as I showed Zoe is a CLI tool, Sonar Scanner is a CLI tool. So I can do like help and see all the different options I can specify. But basically, I just need to run this command. And this will take the source that's on my machine and anything under the, the root directory, which was demo, and push it for analysis by the, the Sonar Cloud instance. So again, I'm using Sonar Cloud, but you could use any uh, scanning tool that's uh, on-prem. Okay, so it's done and it says I can access the results here. So I'm just going to follow the link. And okay, the analysis has run. So it gives you measures of reliability, security, maintainability, um, and coverage. Um, in maintainability section, it gives you estimates on how long it would take to fix all the code smells. If you've never heard of code, code smells, um, it was a new term uh, to me when I started using code analysis tools. It's just code that's difficult uh, to maintain or confusing. And one really great feature with uh, Sonar Cube, Sonar Cloud, is I can click in and see the different uh, code smells that are having uh, issues. So for example, I see this variable is unused. And another great feature, especially folks maybe are onboarding onto the project, maybe they're not familiar with the standards behind writing COBOL, you can click why is this an issue and it'll give you information um, about why it's not compliant um, and how you could make it compliant. In addition, on some of the issues, when you ask why is it an issue, it will even give you references into why it's considering this as a standard. So, you know, it, it helps you improve your code, but it can also help folks learn uh, best practices as well if they're not, not as familiar. Okay. Okay, so this is one project and this was just basically I just set up a sonar cloud project and ran analysis on source code that was uh, in Endeavor. I have a project that I've been running for uh, a number of days now and it's just called marbles. And what I want to show you is that in this project
which is this SOE workshop project. Um, you can easily create um, wrappers around the, that CLI functionality. So for example, I have this gulp file, which is just a task runner. And behind the scenes, everything in this gulp uh, file, all these tasks are powered by Zoe CLI command. So we see Zoe Endeavor Retrieve Element, for example. And I can very easily just, um, a lot of these uh, task runners, they have integrations with your IDE. So I can see my list of tasks as I'm joining this project and just easily double click retrieve source and it'll retrieve source um, into, um, into my project here. So it's completed. If I look here in this case for this project, I was just getting one file, but you can see how I made this as easy as a click, easy as a, a click of a button, right? And now in the terminal here, I can also run I have to get to that repo. I can also run the sonar scanner tool here. And just like profiles in Zoe CLI keep me from repeating information, sonar uh, cube has the idea of having a properties file. So I don't have to re-specify this information every time. Like I don't have to specify the COBOL file suffixes. I can just do sonar scanner. And the one uh, piece of information I don't have stored in the repository is the login. So do sonar login equals, and you're given a, a code here. Okay, and this will run the analysis against my project. I'll wait for this to complete. Okay, great. So it's run as well. I can control click this. I can see the measures on, on this specific one. Again, similar to what I showed just doing it through the CLI. But you can also see the activity and that this was just done. I ran this code analysis at 11.42 and you can see how your, um, how your code has either improved or gotten worse over time. So we can see earlier today, I made a couple improvements and then they reverted back um, recently. So you can kind of see, you know, which way you're trending as far as bugs, code smells, and, and vulnerabilities, which is a really nice feature of, uh, of Sonar Cloud. Now, up till this point, I've only shown um, using sort of these code analysis tools interactively. But where you ultimately want to get to is reuse this interactive code. Uh, that you have written in a CI pipeline. Let me just go back to the slide real quick here. So um, code analysis CI CD, we're just gonna leverage the efforts I've shown so far to ensure that code is analyzed with every run of a, of a pipeline. So we have basically just replaced um, the developer being interactive here to Jenkins, which is the CI tool I'm going to be using the demonstration. If I return to the project and I check out the Jenkins file, this is the stage I have added as part of this effort. So again, I'm just invoking that retrieve source command I've already put in the work to develop. And then I'm running sonar scanner with a login that I'm maintaining using Jenkins secure credentials. And if I go to my Jenkins pipeline, it looks like this. So we see we have code scan now runs before we run the build, deploy, and test of our CI pipeline. And again, it's reusing the same code. And you can see that the, you can also link, it also links in here to the dashboard. So that means that a developer doesn't necessarily have to run this command. You can establish it as a process and then give that feedback to your developer and quickly show uh, leadership within your organization 
how this can benefit um, your, your processes. So that really concludes the demonstration portion. Let me pass the controls back to Sujay to share the deck. Okay, so hopefully by this point, right, we've successfully demonstrated that you can use code analysis tools to show the uh, business value of this DevOps approach quickly to your executive leadership, and that you can introduce DevOps concepts into the mix without disrupting the current developer experience. So what we've created as part of this demonstration is a CI pipeline that performs static analysis using Zoe CLI. And without even getting developers involved in this process, you could send the results back or point your developers to this link so they can review their code, improve their code, and repeat the process. The business benefit of doing this is that you can enable faster code reviews and you should have more maintainable code. So when you fix those code smells, they should help improve the maintainability of, uh, of your source. So with this, I think we can open it up to our, our second polling question. And that is, oh. go ahead. I was gonna say, uh, go ahead and launching it now. Question is, do you foresee code quality scans helping with your code review process? It's right, should be right there up on your screen. You can select from no, we don't do code reviews. No, we don't see these scans helping. Yes, we see this reducing the effort. Yes, we're already doing it or not applicable. So go ahead and make your selection. And also, uh, as, as before, um, if you have a question for our, either of our speakers, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. Hopefully, we'll have a couple minutes for question and answer period to get to some of them. All right, we'll go ahead and close out this poll in three, two, one. Take a look at the results real quick. Yes, we see this reducing the effort by full half of you, so that's great news. Okay, hiding the results, letting you get back, get back to it, Sujay. All right, all right, uh, thank you. So um, I talked about all the requirements for today's demo, but I wanna speak a little bit to the requirements of the Zoe CLI in general. So to have the Zoe CLI on your client machine, you just need node version eight or higher, uh, where the version is also a long-term support version of node. So that's um, even number version. So currently it's supported on node eight, 10 and 12. And these are available, um, you can run it on Windows, Linux or Mac. And the backend service that supports the core functionality of Zoe CLI is the OSMF. Now, you can also extend the functionality of CLI by in, in installing CLI extensions, which have their own dependencies. So for example, in today's demonstration, I didn't use any functionality provided by ZOSMF. I only use functionality provided by uh, the CA Endeavor plugin, which requires CA Endeavor to be installed and the um, web services component of that product to be installed as well. Now, as you can imagine, there's a large number of uh, plugins being developed and are being made available. And we're looking at ways uh, to improve that experience. And one component that, uh, that Sujay mentioned earlier that greatly improves the, the CLI experience is the Zoe API mediation layer. Instead of having to contact each one of these services directly, essentially you can view all your services in a single catalog and access them all through a single host port combination. And that brings me to the topic of Zoe conformance and why it's important and why it's important for you all to encourage your mainframe vendors to add extensions that are conformant. So the specific case I wanna talk about is the API mediation layer. We're currently in an effort to provide single sign-on for services um, in Zoe and we need all, um, we need all integrators to play nicely into this space. 
And that benefits all of you with better end user functionality by being able to access all services through a single uh, API mediation layer and being able to sign in to these services one, one time. So that's one specific example, but by in using conformance services, you will be ensuring that you have um, you ha you have um, plugins and extensions and APIs that all work together well in the Zoe environment and be able to gain confidence um, in both Zoe and the Zoe conformance program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sujay to discuss um, uh, the bright side. Thanks, Mike. All right, so we've seen a, a lot of, of, of Zoe, the role that it plays uh, in you know, helping you with connecting mainframe into DevOps. So it's a pretty, you know, it's evolving into an extremely critical tool. Um, in fact, we, we kind of introduced it as a Swiss army knife. So the number of uses that you might find would, would probably just continue to grow. So what we are doing within Broadcom is we realize that open source can be hard to adopt within enterprises, especially with mainframe where we haven't done much open source before this. So we have uh, a support offering called CA Brightside, which essentially, you know, it takes open source and it really makes it enterprise grade. And the way it does it is we provide 24 seven enterprise grade support, just like how we provide support for any other product that you might get from Broadcom. We have the exact same level of support uh, for uh, Brightside, which has Zoe in it. In addition to Zoe, Zoe also has IDE components from other projects like Code for Z and Shea for Z. Uh, these are, you know, VS Code extensions or a new IDE called Eclipse Shea. We've built extensions for that. We provide support for that as well. Now, in addition to support, we also provide a simplified uh, streamlined installation process. Uh, we provide IP and legal assurance, you know, using, again, using open source on mainframe is new. So any kind of hurdles that you might run into on the legal side, uh, we're here to assist you with that. Uh, additional quality security testing, easier access to innovations from Broadcom around Zoe, uh, any specific integrations, plugins, and APIs that we've built uh, for our products uh, with Zoe that integrate with Zoe, uh, you, you gain easy access to all of that through Brightside. So that's our, our support, enterprise-grade support for Zoe. Now, for all of you mainframe DevOps mobilizers, uh, which many of you are that are on this call, uh, some next steps here. You know, if we to continue to learn and really experiment with a lot of this, and and you know, let's be honest, you don't learn a lot of this by just listening to people like me and and Mike talk. You've really got to get your hands dirty by getting the tools and and looking at uh, what others are doing in blogs like like Medium.com/Zoe. Uh, we've got tons of blogs there uh, that uh, have come from various folks. Uh, one uh, is on just, you know, if you want to learn how to get started with the CLI, installing it, running it, uh, the, the use case that, that Mike just presented, being able to uh, use Zoe CLI to, uh, to pump code into SonarCube and, and get results back. There's blogs on that. Uh, building continuous integration for uh, actually a Kix app running on ZOS. Uh, and then connecting Endeavor uh, to de DevOps using Zoe CLI. There's lots and lots of blogs out there. Uh, but as mobilizers, you have to be the one that clears the path to making some of this adoptable and actually provide business value for your enterprises. And to do that, you need the help of sysprogs and system admins that are working on ZOS to install ZOSMF and other uh, APIs such as Endeavor that, that Mike was talking about, because without those APIs, none of this functionality would be available. And in that process, you may want to share these ideas with other folks within your organization because trust me, DevOps can't be done by one person. You've got to get other people on board uh, and together uh, get consensus and be able to actually drive some of this into execution. Uh, 
you may also want to ask other vendors about their roadmaps for for Zoe. So as I mentioned, Zoe is an open source project. It's not it's not uh, by any means a Broadcom exclusive thing. Uh, we've we've seen extensions from uh, you know Phoenix Software and, and IBM and Rocket and so on. And any vendor that you might uh, be interested in seeing some integration with Zoe, feel free to ask them about their roadmap for integrating with Zoe. Finally. Build relationships. You know, uh, it's all about building bridges. You know, try, you know, getting rid of those silos and 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 really being able to work with systems folks, DevOps folks, uh, even establishing DevOps center of excellence. If one exists, that's great. Try to really get plugged in there. And if it doesn't exist, maybe you know, bring that up as an idea. I've seen many many organizations where, uh, especially in this transitional phase where people are starting to adopt DevOps. Having a center of excellence for it really truly helps. And then you can also lean on the community. So we've got a Zoe user community. Uh, we have a Slack channel available through slack.openmainframeproject.org. Lots of people there sharing how they're using Zoe and how they're getting over them. Broadcom is here to help. So we recognize that this journey is not easy. So we've actually come up with a lot of no fee offerings. Uh, so at no cost to you, We'll run design thinking workshops with you, which are an, an entire day where we spend time with your DevOps teams, your development teams, your system administration teams on the mainframe side. And we really peel the layers to understand, help you understand what your challenges, what your roadblocks, and maybe what your risks are, and use that to come up with a phased roadmap similar to what you saw uh, that I presented earlier. So that's the design thinking workshop. We also have uh, help for preparing your environment. So Mike laid out some requirements for what your environment needs, and we offer technical services to help you prepare your environment for modernizing your mainframe. We also offer hands-on workshops uh, where you get to learn more about these tools and, and really get your, get your hands dirty, use them, and you don't even need to install these tools on your systems. We've got them on ours. We just run through exercises with you in a two-day workshop on, on at your site with a DevOps expert. We also help with POCs. So we'll give you access to DevOps and Zoe experts where you mutually define the scope of a, a proof of concept. And we'll uh, work with you when it's done to actually show the ROI and, and the real value that you're driving from uh, what you've built out. So that's what's on offer. So with, with that, uh, I think we're ready to take some questions if, uh, if there's any that have come in uh, during the webinar. Well, there have been plenty that have come in, but uh, we might be able to have time for one question. We're three minutes to the top of the hour. So if we can do a very quick question, how about this one? This is all done for ZOS. Are there any plans for similar work with ZTPF? TPF, so that's a pretty common question. So as of today, uh, the Zoe project is focused exclusively on ZOS, uh, but I would welcome anybody interested in expanding this out to other, other operating systems to contact the Open Mainframe Project, so openmainframeproject.org. And if you say that, hey, you know, we're interested in doing something similar as what Zoe's doing for ZOS, you may even be able to borrow some of this technology and just you know, tweak it a little bit to make it work with uh, with other operating systems on the mainframe. So contact OMP, Open Mainframe Project. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we, unfortunately we don't have any time for any more questions, but please note to anybody who did send a question in, uh, the folks uh, from uh, Zoe, uh, Sujay and Mike uh, included, will be getting a copy of all of the questions that came in, so I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you guys offline. Uh, before we close things out, uh, I did want to go ahead and do the drawing for the $350 Amazon gift cards. So without further ado, our first winner today is Laura P. Congratulations, Laura. Our second winner is David T. Congratulations, David. And our final winner today is Tony S. Congratulations, Tony S. We'll be contacting you guys offline via email to get your gift cards over to you.
And also want to remind the audience real quick that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. We are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be on the DevOps.com website. So you can always find it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Sujay and Mike, thanks so much for a great presentation. Lots of great information today. Appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Thank All right. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody.